The focus on this channel has been how to maximize small watercraft, and we do mean small. It seemed that the smaller the boat, the bigger the challenge, the funner it was, and the better the outcome. But just once, just this once, after doing all of these tiny boats, why don't we just try just one big boat? The biggest John boat I have ever seen, to be exact, and put forth within it a vision to make the ultimate outdoors boat. I'm gonna take this thing on solo with my small garage and my front driveway, and somehow we're gonna pull out a boat that can do it all. Where most boats you get from the factory can only do one or two things, we'll try to hit all of these objectives. We'll entertain the family. It'll be fun to fish off of. It will possess the best qualities of a bass boat and also have the best qualities of a bow fishing rig. Everything that makes those two platforms successful, we will combine them to make the ultimate sportsman rig that is a blast to use in the day, but will light up by night. It'll light up in ways that no other bow rig has ever done before. So sit back, relax, grab your popcorn and get ready. Cause here we go. This video is brought to you by Plashlights, supreme quality waterproof LEDs, a lifetime warranty with almost no questions asked, a full automated phone app that can control lights at will, and that's just their LED strips. They have other products that are equally as epic. Cars, RVs, UTVs, trucks, you name it. All the lights and products used by them will be listed in the video description and also pinned in the comment section. Check them out. This video is also time linked with key moments and chapters that are hyperlinked in the video description and also in the comment section below. You can just click to your specific time or simply scroll with your finger on the phone to get right where you want to be in the section. This is an Allwell 2070 John boat. And John and his crew here are doing a little bit of work before it comes to me. They are prepping the boat, they gutted it, and now they are laying out parts of the frame that they would like set in. So when it comes to me, I kind of already have a layout. But when I looked at the layout and looked at what they were trying to do, I shortly kind of schemed up my own thing. And right away we overcomplicated everything. Did I mention that I'm not really fit to build a boat like this? I don't have a shop or the gear or people or the infrastructure. I just have an inflated sense of confidence for my skill. But it's okay because I don't know if I've ever truly enjoyed a project unless I was scared the whole time that I couldn't really actually pull it off. You tend to become a different person when you have to do something versus get to choose to do something. The boat is laid out how he wants it, with the setback from the front and back deck and the cockpit. Now it's just up to me to frame it, and I'm going to frame it in a unique way. One of these sides unwelded, so you can kind of see the edge. We cut off the top little flange here, an inch and a half out, cut it off with that little porta band, and slid it in here, right? And then you would go ahead and weld in this. For frames like this, a lot of people will just use 1x2 square tubing, which is what's throughout the boat before it got here. It makes sense if you don't mind gaps and voids inside your boat, but because we're trying to maximize storage, that is the whole reason we're doing this layout in the front. Um, we are trying to get rid of any sort of voids that are unnecessary, and using angle, will tighten and expand everything with the thinnest walls and the biggest compartments. And this will be in line with our max efficiency model. For the sides, that's where we're gonna put all the foam. We're not gonna put any foam in the subfloor. We know that just to be not great for the boat long term. So the subfloor itself will be the only hollow void where water drains and channels and exits the boat. This boat will have two giant side lockers. This one will be the rod locker with a compartment underneath that extends farther in for longer things such as spud poles, gigging rods, push poles, long nets, and even hunting arms if you want. And this one will be specifically for bows. There will also be a live well that sits pretty generously above the platform and will need special attention to rig. For the shooting, we are using 1 16th inch thick 5052 aluminum. This is the thinnest we can go where we know that it's still fairly light but rigid enough to handle high speeds on the boat. And we're using rivets to attach all the sheet metal. We're using rivets where anything that is non-load bearing or structural can be put because it's a cleaner look. But obviously, a lot of this boat will have to be welded. It's just the way it is. Hey guys, if you like this video and you find it useful, please give us a like and a comment and possibly a share. Doing this helps me and any other YouTubers that you like to grow. 
So far, the shooting process is going well and so is the framing, but the framing is honestly the easiest part of the boat, whether you have to weld or rivet it. Before we get too ahead of ourselves, we need to frame pedestal mounts in certain sections of the boat for certain configurations. Doing a lot of this is just simply new to me, so I re-welded and refinished a lot of stuff, which actually took me a much longer time to finish the frame, but I did want it to make sure it was secure. Didn't have to look the prettiest, but it did have to be strong and secure. I'm just chilling in the seats here. These are really comfortable seats. And it kind of just fits right. This will just barely clear the light boxes and it will just clear this pedestal mount and it just clears me if I'm turning. Framing the boat is maybe the funnest thing because it makes you feel like you've gotten somewhere, even though you've gotten really nowhere. I've never done a boat this big, but I do know for every two feet bigger that a boat gets, a substantial amount more material needs to go into it. One major problem before we can truly go any farther is what are we going to do with these gunnels? They're ugly, they have bars welded to them, and they had damage to them before that was even a thing. The only way to fix this is to cap them with something. So we figured out a way to shield them, make them stronger, so if it gets ran into something, it won't have the problems that the original gunnels clearly had where they dented in. So the gunnel idea I put into use, this is 2 inch by 3 16 inch uh, angle. 6061. We slotted it all the way down the top up until the very, very end where there's like a 49 inch piece. I, I really kind of want to frame the rails out because the farther we go in here, if I go too far, then I might mess up the rail. I'm like, it's this part where we're playing 4D chess with the design. Fishing lights are what make the bow rig a bow rig, but there are a few different ways to mount them. The first initial idea that they did out of their shop initially was a gate structure like this. But then I came and I wanted boxes. Boxes look way better than the gate structure. But I don't have a giant professional brake that can just bend sheet metal that long. And I don't even know anybody in town that will do that for me. So I got around it by framing it. And then we'll use thinner sheet metal on top of the thicker frame. And it'll weigh about as much as it would have if I ever got one braked and pressed out this way. But because it's welded to the hole directly the way it is, it should be a lot stronger. Before we get too far ahead with the front, we need to take care of a big problem. The back of the boat is a very big problem. We're not quite sure what to do with this thing. Hey guys, if you see one of our videos and you feel like the general public videos are not enough, we do have more. We have master classes here on YouTube and also purchased through our website. And we also have Patreon, our longest standing platform to interact directly with exclusive members in ways that we simply cannot do through YouTube or any other social media platform, such as things like these. Whether you're a YouTube channel member or a patron, we appreciate you. After much contemplation, I finally decided to solve the back platform problem by adding a third step right there on the transom, which links the beaver pods all the way up to the back deck, giving a total of four steps, which will actually be kind of cool. It'll allow us to have some things that we weren't otherwise going to be able to have. And we'll also be able to make giant foam pockets within those steps that will offset places where we need it since we're not putting any foam in the subfloor. Upon removing the motor controls so I could reroute them through the new design, I realized they won't go through the new design, and now we're going to have to get hydraulic steering and controls. And I don't know how to do that, so we're going to have to get that done uh, through friends of ours. In researching bow rigs, they all had these pulling platforms, but they weren't for pulling, they were for holding a generator way high up there above the motor for a few reasons. And they actually held them on a lot of rubber mats, and that cut down the noise and the vibration throughout the hull and quieted the boat while it's going through the water. My son steps up in this boat project substantially. He helps me out with a lot. Now on to the next problem. This console. Not only is it ugly, it's just not going to fit with the new layout. There's no way to use it. So we're gonna to have to get a new one. He also ordered a target top for this boat, but I don't think he calculated the fact that, well, he raised the deck all the way to the top. So this target top is not gonna work unless you're a really short person. So we have to figure that out. Josh Amos from High Shoals Boats sent me this console. It's so awesome, I think we're gonna carry him in our store. We butted it up to the front deck and installed it on the initial subfloor and there will be a secondary subfloor in there. But before we can even install that, we gotta get the hydraulic system going. And what a better place to do that than Fallon Marine.
He can run it through the bottom one, but like, we, so we, we make conduits specifically for all this crap right through the bench. And then we use door edge guards so there can be no fraying. While you're at it, check out our web store, tbnation.net, because pretty much all the parts we use to build this boat can be found here. And for the things that we may not have on that store, we definitely have on our Amazon store. We also have one of those. Whichever one you choose, we should be able to cover you in any product you need. After telling John that his target top would only work for people who are four feet, um, he still wouldn't let it go. So we figured out a way to incorporate it and make a new one. We did this by making a T-top, but it will have to be built differently because there is no space to put four legs, which is generally what a T-top has. We only have spots for two, one on each side. We accomplish this by using one by three by one eighth aluminum tubing. And then we use automotive paint and clear coat to finish it off. To ensure longevity of design, I put two more pieces and butted them against the initial piece to make a tubed angle. So that's one by three tubed angle essentially welded together. It by itself is extremely strong. There's no need for additional legs. It supports the top completely. It also gives us areas to attach a slew of other things that were real problems to install without a platform to put them on. We're able to put this super high powered light bar from flashlights, the fish finder, and that stereo system all up there along with other things and additional lights. The T-top that John initially got was from Amazon. It was fairly cheap, a few hundred bucks, and it was really flimsy, like super thin gauge aluminum. I thought initially the wind would just yank this thing and rip it right off. But after traveling down the road at high speeds, you know, traveling to and from lakes, it holds up pretty good. There's almost no flex. I can't believe it. So it actually works. If you're trying to possibly just make your own T-top specific to your boat, you can totally splice this one in with your own design like we did here. All right, so we got the back hatches all strutted and latched, just, just making sure it all works and fits and closes and opens correctly, which they all do. Now we got a, we got that all ran, all the cables, the major cables are ran. We got to loom it correctly. Right. Kind of, this is windy as crap. The wind is like all the rigging pretty much takes freaking forever. So we'll just spend a day of rigging. So before this gets uh, any more complicated and the stuff starts getting covered up, I want to show you this. This is our live wool. It's an 18 gallon. We've got the stamp at the bottom. It runs in and it actually makes the water channel to the middle where there's an indent for the flow right kit. It has the recess indents to get all the water to the point where the only residual water is going to only stack right in there and the rest of the level will dry up. And we have our flow right, uh, aerator pump out nozzle with the two with the chamber. Got the dual chambers here. Pops out. Same thing when you pop it out like this. Uh, the water leaves a live wall. It's in here, it's recirculating or it's just filling. We have the overflow here and make sure make sure your overflow is slightly lower set lower to where this will continue to stay out of the water you know that the nozzle does spin in a 360 motion so you can just shoot it this way that way like it's going but like the the water spraying as it grabs air through these vents it sprays a lot of air it aerates the water by itself so make sure that your that your overflow is a little bit lower that way it doesn't overtake this because if it overtakes the the water yeah it'll keep filling with new water but the ability for it to aerate correctly is going to take it away if it gets overtaken by water so that always sits a little lower than this you also want it 
on the opposite side if you can do it. I know it's hard in a lot of boats, but for this one, we, we did it where it fills on one end and constantly flows out the other. That way water is pushing this way, pushing this way, if you can do it. I know a lot of times it's tough. A lot of times you guys end up running both fittings on the same side of the live well. It still, it still gets done, but this is the best way. And right here, this was gonna be a storage for the gas tank, but then we ended up making a dead box. Tank to throw dead fish in. So if you look in here, there's the major wall and the inner wall of that the compartment, a gigantic compartment that we have insulated the back wall to go into live well. We insulated the underneath. The parts that kind of got too hot and melted a little bit, we'll just fill it in with gap filler. This is elevated just a little bit to where we can run the plumbing out this way. Then we got, we started running the plumbing hose, but the plumbing hose can just kind of go in here. We run the overflow and it slowly, slowly goes down. So it's a constant downward all the way into here. There it is. That's just a nice little casual drip. We also rigged two bilge pumps and we have these bilge pump brackets that allow you to reposition the through hole fittings from outside of your hole like it used to be in the old days to just right on your transom. We also plan to run lights everywhere. We have epic transom lights. We're gonna run one between the paws underneath the motor and these corporate lights going up the steps. Both of these together should look pretty good. One of the nice things about this brand new console is fresh new areas to put anything you want on it. So we're gonna go ahead and mount two of our TV Nation switch panels in. A giant part of the rigging is pre-wiring. That means running all the wires directly into your main hub where you're gonna tie everything together and make it all work. Organizing and cleaning up the wires with wire loom is preferred. This boat is also gonna require its own switch panel specifically for all the lights we're about to stick in this boat. Every place that we can light this boat up, we will. So on an average boat needing six to eight switches, this will need 10 to 12. So we template and we make spots to drop this directly into the console. It just needs to be a rectangle. It doesn't need to be fancy. You don't need to cut out the individual switch parts. I just traced where the switches were, drew a fairly thin box around them. That way I knew whenever I dropped the panel in, it would clear that area. You sand it to make sure there's no fraying of the wires when you install or, or take out the switch panel and then it's good. Be prepared to give yourself plenty of time to wire and rig this boat. That will take the longest part. Framing it is one thing, designing it is the other thing. But rigging it, the actual part that glues the boat together, will take you the longest. And now to start pouring the foam. We have four major big pockets where the foam will go in, plus the sides. The sides have a really generous void that we can just saturate with foam. We blocked it off down there with wood and gap filler because all it's doing is just blocking the foam from going down into the subfloor. This boat's actually starting to whoop me pretty good. With the weather and not having an accurate garage, I'm behind schedule by a lot. So my crew comes down to kind of visit me and fish for a little bit and also help me. You guys know Nate, right? Master builder out of Illinois, runs our Illinois shop, a little shy on social media, but he does great things. Fill in some of this. Dang, look at that. That's pretty precise. We use gap filler to fill any other void that we think pore foam might pry its way into and just expand and possibly break the seam or just leak into a compartment we don't want it to go in. Sweet. How many kits is this? I finished that U.S. composite kit and I'm halfway through a total boat kit. Hey, good job with that foot footwork. It's pro. That's why he's standing in there. Sweet. Don't touch it. <laughs> I know you want to. Don't do it. He'll never come off. Go ahead, man. It's all you. Oh, I don't want to die. Ugh. How does it feel? It's doing good. All right, so there was my crew. They came and helped me. They did what they could. The weather really kind of screwed us from getting any real momentum, but it is what it is. The biggest fail in my planning was thinking that my skill and drive alone would outweigh any sort of adversity from the weather. Truth is, stand alone at this point with a boat this big trying to rig the whole thing, it's gonna take me forever. I couldn't finish the boxes until I finished the deck. I had to weld the entire deck onto the flats. Our lids are made to work with either platform, plywood, or aluminum sheet metal like this. In this case, we're using 0.090 aluminum sheets, which match our 0.090 thick aluminum tracks the lids sit in. The hatches themselves are 1 8 inch thick. 
and they can come powder coated or blank like this and you can paint them any color you'd like. One of the bigger visions I thought would look really good is if we could make the front plate like this, but also add perforated metal to the boxes to give it a shine through from the lights and just an edgy look. But we won't know how that looks until we light it up and we're far away from lighting that up. We're still not even done with the boxes. These at this point are only half done. It needs an additional double wall to make it sufficient for the lights we're about to rig it with. But before we can do that, we should probably turf at least the front deck. So while we're working on it, it'll be a little bit more comfortable and we'll have accurate gapping for everything else we need to make. Come and check us out on Facebook. We have both a public page and a group that is the biggest one on the platform. Come check us out and show your stuff off. So if you're still this far in the video and you're doing all right, this is where it gets a little complicated. I mean, everything else was whatever it was, but these lights, they're gonna add a whole new element. Not because they're terribly hard to wire. I mean, it's pretty much plug and play. They have harnesses, they all connect together, you control them with one button. It's the stupid power supply. These are 24 volt, 160 watt lights. It draws so much power, it would deplete a lithium battery within an hour. While making the frame for the boxes, we welded a piece of angle all the way around inside the box, and that was gonna be where the lights hung down from. And the wires will all be hidden behind the lights. Pull through grommets into the double wall, which hasn't been made yet. So far, so good. But if you're looking at it from the inside, not so good. Now you start to see where it gets complicated, and there aren't even any power supplies on it yet. Well, lo and behold, there they are. What are we gonna do with them? My plan is to stack them on top of each other and make a vent screen out of perforated aluminum. That way they have constant area to breathe. We'll accomplish this by making a double wall as thick as they are, which will probably be roughly an inch and a half thick. We just so happen to have architectural grade 16 gauge aluminum angle on hand, which is light. And it doesn't matter because everything else is structural and this is not terribly low bearing, it's just a fake wall. And we put aluminum flat bar in between the segments as joiners to attach the fascia later. All right, got all five hooked up now. So, and it's all ran in that wall. So let's make sure it all works. The test button. <laughs> I would say it works exceptionally well. It lights up like the whole street. It's like street lights. They're so bright, I can't even look at them without looking through the phone. Like they're just, that's obscene. Well, if you want to be seen on the water, like that is the way. So let's just take a quick look at these just at what I see at face value, you know, for science. So a lot of the floodlights that I see on bow rigs only have one or two LED squares. This one has 10, so there's that. And there's a million little things inside each square. Some of them are white, some of them are orange. These are two-tone. They can actually dip to like an amber color or a straight white color, depending on the clarity of the water. That's what they're meant for. So there's supposed to be the top lights on the market, likely because of their brightness and their two-tone ability, but they are a pain to load up. So if you have a gate, you're gonna have wires showing everywhere if that matters to you. If it doesn't, it doesn't. As much of a mess it was to organize all of it, connecting it all was fairly easy. The only thing we have left to install now to make those lights run optimal all the time is the generator. It's raining again. Why is it raining again? I don't know how much room's in this boat. <laughs> so big you can fit a small person. Hey, I'm normal size. We haven't even begun to really break down and finish this boat. So many finishing aspects need to happen. Like for one, we need to now top those boxes. We template and cut 0.063 aluminum sheeting, welded it where we need to to actually make the bending V, and then we riveted it right to that sucker. This took me all freaking day. This is where I cannot get, like it's such a simple task, you're in the moment, and then look, the time lapse, the day is gone. Like, where did it go? It's like, it's fleeting. Look, the sun, it's gone. Look, there it goes. That trolling motor has caused me so many problems within the install. It kind of broke me last night. I kind of low key cried on the inside. So I have this quick release bracket I just purchased again. It was always there, but it now became blatantly obvious that I've bitten off more than I can chew. I cannot do this boat in the time that is allotted to, like, I'll ever never get this thing done. I need help. So my son, myself, uh, Richard, and a new friend of ours, Oren, are all teaming up to work on this boat and get it done as fast as possible so I can do something else. We start to install the flash lights finally, the LED strips. The whole reason I made the cages the way they did with those perforated metal and all these extra rails. And then there's a the matter of running the swamp by. 
We need a 3,500 watt generator to be able to run all those lights comfortably with a little bit more power to spare if needed for something else. Oh, there they go. Look at that. No flicker. Look at it. Jeez, look at that. Oh, yeah. That's great. Dude, high five. That's great, man. I rigged that up. Yeah, those lights are so bright, they're even brighter now. You can't even look at them in the sun. Yeah, I, I got sunglasses. Yeah, you gotta put sunglasses on just to look at them. So all that light is coming from my front yard. Like all of it. It's sliding all the way down the street. We hooked both power outlets to a three-way 10-gauge connector to another 10-gauge 120-watt yellow cord, the thickest, strongest, most expensive cord we could find. Run it all the way up there. Cut it around 30-ish plus feet. It was a pretty long run, so it had to be 10 gauge, could not be 12. At times when we were all vibing and everything was flowing, we felt like we were unstoppable, that we were gonna totally meet the deadline for this thing and then not blow it for a second time. But just truly, I don't know what it is. What felt like minutes was actually hours. What was actually hours felt like days. I guess when you're in the moment, you just lose track of time. Like it's two or three in the morning right here. We're all just grinding. The neighbors are pissed. They all think we're on meth. But it doesn't matter because we're on a roll and we're about to finish this stupid boat. Look at it, it's almost done. We're just one more thing away from the other thing that leads to the other thing. And when we're done with that, then we'll finally be done with this boat. Kennel Lake number 5,899. We almost finished it. I mean, heck, look at here. It looks pretty darn good, right? It's set for. We truly weren't even close. We had been lying to ourselves. I now know things about myself. I know that the first time I read out building boats for people, I became very spoiled because I could just build boats at my leisure because I built them for the audience. And that actually allowed me to come at my best. It's been a long time since I got drugged through the mud and had to grind like this to meet a deadline that seemed impossible. It's easy to be good at something and then have people drawn to you because you're good at your craft. But it's another thing to do something for people and do it successfully. Truly, I don't know how people build boats for other people and not want to shoot themselves afterwards. I hate this boat. I want to light it on fire. I regret the day I ever took it on. It's cost me money and time and it's a sponsored event, so I don't know if it'll yield anything, truly. With every boat I've done, the more complex it was, the more advanced it got, the more I hated it toward the end. So why do I even waste my time at all doing projects like these? The fact is, I don't have to like it. Love and hatred for the craft are but two sides of the same coin. You must love the journey more than you like the end goal. If I focus on the ending goal and the ending progress of what this boat will yield, I'll hate it till the day I die. But if I focus on the journey, the skill obtained in effort to build it, the fact that I was scared the whole time I wasn't gonna be able to pull it off, but I did. And for a brief moment in time, right before it got taken away, I got to enjoy it. have changed they'll never be the same the goalpost is constantly moved and so the risk you have to take have to be big and big risk doesn't mean that you'll actually win sometimes you'll just have to take an l i've been blessed by you guys to become an artist that builds boats for the masses 
I went backwards and took a step down from that to build this. Having you guys around gives me an inflated sense of skill and ability. Make me believe that I can pull off anything, even when I can't. And in essence, I relearned an old lesson that I had long forgotten. That the journey is much more important than the end goal. And the journey to build this boat, though it came with risks and it came with consequences, was worth it because the skill and the personal and professional growth that I achieved during the project is something that I have not achieved for the better part of eight years that we have been doing this. We've all been around a long time. It's time to grow. It is time to take risks. It is time to put it all on the line and see what you're made of. So when you face a project so big and so intimidating that you yourself don't even know if you can pull it off, focus on the journey and you'll be all right.